All right then. How are we doing? Good morning, everyone. Everybody's good. Yeah, well, if this is cold to you, hold on tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go to Buffalo. It's not. Uh, it doesn't get easier from here. Um, all right. Bokatov. Good morning. Good morning. I, uh, as we start, uh, we'll put in a couple of plugs. Um, one, uh, the, there was going to be a program at the JCC tonight. It's canceled. The speaker can't uh, can't make it. Is ill. Um, so that. Two, tomorrow, uh, this weekend, we'll have a scholar in residence in the area, um, Rabbi Sharon Konasfeld, who's the uh, president of Hebrew College outside of Boston, which is a pluralistic rabbinical school. She'll be at Beth El on Friday night and Saturday morning here, giving it a Devar Torah, and, um, and then a lunch and learn over Kiddush. Um, so that Rabbi, do you and know Bethel is Bethel? like scratching their Saturday morning service and coming here. So like, so like I, so someone, so my thing, I'm less concerned with what more concerned with like not being embarrassed. <laughs> so, so is Bethel being but, zoomed as well? Everything will be as normal. So just like every Shabbat service is zoomed, we're not going to turn off this. The afternoon one, probably not. I'm not set up for that. And we don't have a technology committee outside of me and Brian. Um, so um, so since uh, since we lack volunteers on on the to set things up outside of uh, morning services, uh, no, not for that one. But morning services, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll be here as uh, as usual. Um, so that's um, that's this weekend. Um, next week, um, a week from today is Rosh Chodesh, also Thanksgiving, um, which me and an air of Thanksgiving. Wednesday night we'll have our usual uh, interfaith service. Um, unusually, it will be at the Al Fala Center, uh, the mosque on two hundred six. Um, unusual in part because last year it wasn't there for us to have it in, but now it is. Um, so that, um, and again, by way of warning, part of the, you know, everyone's got their own rules. We make people wear small hats and such. One of the rules at the mosque is that they don't have instrumental music, which means no bells. Um, the bell choir couldn't come anyway, but you know, if they could, they couldn't. So um, that, so it'll be different. Seven o'clock Wednesday night. They ask that you register, so they know how many people are coming. So that link is in the email. If you need to forward to you, let me know. Um, so uh, for those of you who want to come to the morning meeting on Thursday, it's not at a quarter to seven in the morning. You get to sleep an extra hour and change. Starts at eight o'clock. Eight o'clock morning minion next Thursday. Rosh Chodesh. Um, you get to sing Hallel with me, and. Um, yeah, no, there's lots of stuff. Bethel is also having a cantorial concert on December 4th that Rabbi CC is participating in. If you want uh, if you want Jewish events um, and there aren't enough for you, don't blame us. We get to study Torah, which is as Jewish an event as we can do. Uh, and the bracha for Torah study is Baruch Ata Arunai. Eloheinu melech alam asher kedishanu v'mitzvotav v'tivanu l'asok b'divrei Torah. And, yeah. And um, we're working our way through the book of Genesis. And uh, as uh, Norm said, he said it more politely than this, but like we hope to finish the book of Genesis before the sun dies. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the way he put it before the Messiah shows up. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> the, right the, um, so this, uh, now we did days one, two, three. Speeding along. Speeding along. Uh, and again, they, there are many ways to um, to sort of like think of the days and how they stack up. Um, many stack them in, or you can stack them in sort of two 
three piles, right? Which are like the first days are things that are um, in place, fixed in place. And the, and the second three days, four, five, six, have uh, all the things have motion, right? Like the um, from light, uh, sky, what land and vegetation are days one, two, three, and all those things are there. And then the other ones, sun and moon and stars move you know, to the eye. They move, uh, uh, then, uh, then fish and birds, and then people and animals move. One question we ask is, what's a day? Right, so day is, is debatable. Like, th there's no way of saying, right? Because day four is the sun, right? So, so does that mean that there are 24 hour days before the sun? Obviously, I feel like it's just not thinking that way. It really- um, It's just uh, things that happen. Yeah, I mean, that becomes, yeah, or like, or like units of time, like, eh, like it really becomes relevant. Yeah, when you're fighting with somebody who like takes this literally, um, or like, or literally in a, in a scientific way. But, um, but again, like, I don't think that's like the intention of the text to begin with. So, is it 24 hours? But it's 24 hours without the um, the eight time, the second shelf down. Oh, you got the uh, yeah the uh, the. Um, yeah. There's this notion that God needs time. Because or God is he, using time. Well, first of all, I don't want to think that he gets tired. But he but but God does rest. At the point. Right. So okay. Just I, I don't think he wears out. Like, <laughs> but 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 well well that's sort of the uh that's this thing because on one level most of the creation that's taking place seems utterly effortless. God said, and there was, you know, this is, um, it's, it's very ethereal. It's very effortless and beautiful and smooth. So part of the question is, it's not like if I make something, one, good luck, two, um, like there's effort involved and you're exhausted at the end of, of the project. The, uh, this is speaking things into being. So it's weird that there's rest at the end. In addition to the, well, what's up? If this is God, like, why is there? Right. So. Spencer Tracy and Frederick March in a great movie, The Hell of the Wind. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, the uh, Frederick March fan, just in part because the um, the small theater um where there's plays and artsy movies and wisconsin was named after march because he was an alum uh so yeah i was and i catered my way through college so i catered things up the frederick march spot so yes and i had the one yes so it's not i mean that that again like this it's not um the in this great doorstop of a book um the beginning of wisdom uh, by Leon Cass. Cass, I've, I, every so often, every couple of years, I read it, and then you end up hearing from it in my Divrei De Torah. Um, it's great. He's a um, he's actually an eth a secular Jew who's an ethicist at the University of Chicago, and decided to teach a course in the ethics of the Book of Genesis, and ended up um, and ended up being entranced by it, and wrote this really lovely book last year. And this is like. 15, 20 years ago. Last year, he published one or two years ago on Exodus that I ordered and haven't read yet, but I love the Genesis one. Um, he uh, uh, also was on like when President Bush like was sort of junior was, this is called The Beginning of Wisdom and it reads Genesis as a wisdom text. Um, so um, so it's, he's a good writer, it's deep. Um, he, says there's some like 50 cent words here but if the major intention of the first chapter of genesis is not historical but ontological ethical and theological meaning and philosophical in a sense genesis is not the sort of book that can be refuted or affirmed on the basis of scientific or historical evidence that is i repeat not because it is myth or poetry but rather because its truths are metaphysical and ethical not scientific or historical because it teaches mainly about the status of human meaning of what is rather than about the mechanism by which things work or came to be, which is to say 
that it's not a story telling you about an event that happened. It's not history that way, um, nor is it scientific. The world came into being, you know, say 5,783 years ago with an adult man and woman speaking Hebrew with a talking snake in a garden with a magic tree, right? Like that's not supposed to be, that's not, it's not a scientific claim, right? What it's trying to teach you actually is partly here, which is um, even in the days that we did, which is that most people, and it's hard for modern, as he points out, to get this because of, because you came in from the cold, right? And, um, and you drove here. And um, we're in a heated room with electric light, and um, and and it's hard to wonder at the night sky because you know there are street lights blocking it, even in street light deprived Somerset County. Um, but 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 like, wait, 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 like the, the, there's a sense of uh, but. The point of part of the first few chapters, the first few days, is that, oh, don't worship the sun. The sun isn't your god, as most humans, not just in that region, we're not just talking about the Mesopotamian myths or something like that, but like everyone in the Americas at this time, they were worshiping the sun and they weren't influenced by what was going on in Babylonia, I'm pretty sure. Like the, right, they were, they were, they were doing similar things, which tells us if they're doing it in Australia and the Americas and um, and in the Middle East and in Europe, that tells you that this is a human thing and not like a local cultural thing, that this is sort of inherent in humanity, that people worship the sun. So like the radical claim here is the sun is created. And um, uh, before I let it go, I'll get to you in a second, Sandy, like the part of what the nice thing it does here is, um, Ah, so, and what one may rightly ask is wrong, ethically speaking, in looking up to cosmic gods or worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars and things like this. The Bible's answer, a teaching it shares with modern scientific dogma, would seem to be that it would seem to be that nature is morally neutral. From the point of view, skip, skip, skip. From the point of view of righteousness, indeed, for all practical purposes, cosmic gods are about as helpful as no gods at all. Meaning, you can learn you can learn a lot of things from nature, and um, you know, we can read Psalm 19, which sometimes we read on Shabbat morning. It says the heavens declare the glory of God. He says the heavens may declare the glory of God, but to say not a peep about righteousness, right? Like that the. Bible's concern, the Torah's concern, is in creating human beings into righteous, morally upright individuals, and you can't learn that from nature. You can learn lots of things from nature, and it may reflect God's greatness, as it were, but in order to say that there's a moral order to the universe, you need an actor, uppercase A, behind the nature, and that's that's the claim of Genesis. Um, it's That's more chapter two than chapter one, but wait, Sandy first. Before an answer. So um, I think the passage that you read a couple of minutes ago yeah. addresses the question that I was asking last week. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That if if who wrote this, you know, if we can assume mm -hmm. that we're not human beings, they were not in existence at the time that this this happened. Right. So I, what he's saying is you can't look at this as history. So I think. Does that go to the same? Right, right. So again, like in the like spinning plate theory, like so two things at once. One, read it traditionally, which is God's God is the speaker, God is the narrator, uppercase N. Um, so I think it's worth reading it that way. Um and so what is this? Um, it's the other direction. Instead of God speaking to speaking to God, or um, rather than the heavens reaching down to earth to tell us what's up, or to say, this is how you're supposed to live. This is human sort of reaching up to the heavens, like sort of calling out, like, how are we supposed to live? So um, yeah, so either way, I think the right way to read it as as part of that conversation, um, almost by definition, if you're in this room, um, you're more likely to be in the bottom-up conversation than in the top-down conversation. No, it is more. 
Right, 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 right. And right, and he um right. Right. Uh, it can't be refuted or affirmed on the basis of scientific or historical evidence, meaning that th that whole you know argument you have with the at risk of getting into stereotypes, you know, with you know the uh, the Bible thumper um, speaking with a not New Jersey accent. Uh, the uh, it's not big. You, you can't you can't refute it based on that. It's not about scientific or historical evidence, um, and not because it's not it is not myth nor poetry, but rather its truths are metaphysical and ethical, not scientific or historical, because it teaches mainly about the status of the status and human meaning of what is, rather than about the mechanism by which things work or came to be. Um, the ethical isn't evident, I think, in, Ge in Genesis 1. That's more apparent in Genesis 2. Because as they, as they also say, like every, you know, we go through all these days and it says, and God said it was good. But like the good can't be an ethical good because the light isn't ethically good or bad. It just, it just means fitting. So the good here means something like fitting or appropriate to its use, right? It's like a good chair. The chair isn't ethically good. Um, the way, the only thing, by the way, that can be ethically good, this is part of the point of it, the only thing that can be ethically good is human beings, right? Who, like, and this is, this is part of what makes it great and part of his insight is that there's a, um, uh, things are called good, right? Like the, you know, the plants are good, which means that they do, it's, it's not a moral thing. They're doing what they're supposed to do. The tree has no moral value one way or the other. Um, the, um, or can't act morally. The, um, the, everything gets good, but spoiler alert, when we get to the sixth day, guess what's not called good? Humans. So women, but not, but not exclusively. Humans. Human, yeah, human beings are not labeled a good, right? The animals are called good because a dog can be dog. And even like if you say good dog, like uh, you might be like argue about this on the sides, but like sort of like essentially like sort of like the, the good dog is like, is just being a good version of a dog, right? Like the, um, and, uh, and, you know, flies, you know, whatever the animal is, it's just sort of being itself. Um, it might be more compliant or better serving our needs but um, the only thing that can be morally good or not is us. Um, and so we're not labeled a good. And that's because the rest of the book is about that struggle, right? The rest of the book is about the struggle of human beings to be ethically good. Um, and that's and that's like the so the so the good of the the good of the tree is that oh, the tree gives fruit or gives shade or it holds the earth in place or whatever it might be, right? Um, so it's good, it's appropriate to it, but humans are more than appropriate to the task. Um, there's a there's an ethical component. So that, that will become more evident in chapter two, the second creation story. The first creation story is God speaks and it is. The second creation story which you'll see, it's a, it seems to be a separate freestanding story, possibly, um, is about that moral struggle. Because here, people almost have no independent uh, action. All right. uh, but this, I, Cass, is really, uh, is, uh, is really amazing. Um, it's right on through his read of Abraham, his read of Joseph, um, he stays very close to the text and the words, and it's really nice. And he ended up teaching like a seminar at the University of Chicago on this stuff. Um, the quick aside, there's nothing to do with anything. Last year, like when my kids were getting college come-ons, like the letters from college, we got one from the University of Chicago. And the pictures of that place, it's the school that looks most like Hogwarts. Like it was just sort of these sort of like grand, like wooden libraries and things like that. And it really, they know their audience, I feel like, which is, looks like Hogwarts. Anyway, so um, I want to look at, we're going to pick up with day four. Um, so day four, 
begins with verse 14, chapter 1 of Breshit, verse 14. If you're looking at Robert Alter, we're still on the first page. The um, the Hebrew, the English, uh, the, uh, and again, all of these um, still just using the word Elohim, the word for God in chapter 1 is always simply Elohim, just meaning God. Where Elohim? Ye morgot rakia. Uh, and, and God said, let there be lights in the space of the skies to distinguish between the day and the night, and they will be for signs and appointed times and for days and years, right? So like this is to norms like opening question like what do you mean that there was a day day one day two day three if only here on day four is there a sun and not only is there only on day four a sun and a moon but um but that they they are to determine to love deal to distinguish to separate between days and nights like it's sort of like it's um it's hard to it's hard to understand and to um uh and they will set the Moadim, which are like special holidays, right? Um, Moed is the term for one of the terms for a holiday in Hebrew. So it sets the, like, because the holidays in the Gregorian calendar are set by the Gregorian calendar, right? It depends on nothing. Um, the in the Hebrew calendar, like in the Muslim calendar or in the Chinese calendar, or whatever, like the um, it's determined by the heavenly bodies, right? It's only what becomes the sort of standard world calendar is the only thing is one of the few that separates from that. Maybe it's why it becomes, uh, but uh, but yeah. So the sun and the moon will determine when the holidays are, and that's actually their purpose, according to this. Um, separate between day and night, and and determine the holidays and the days and the years. Um, and they will be for lights in the space of the skies to shed light on the earth. And it was so. Um, sort of again, like a funny sentence. Um, the. Uh, uh, the, uh, his uh, Robert, uh, Richard Elliott Friedman's comment is: Note that the daylight is not understood here to derive from the sun. The text understands that the light that surrounds us in the daytime to be an independent creation of God, which has already taken place on the first day. The sun and moon and stars are understood here to be light sources, like a lamp or torch, only stronger. Their purpose is also to be the markers of time, days, years, appointed occasions. This also implies an answer to an old question. Friedman writes, people have questioned whether the first three days are 24-hour days since the sun is not created until the fourth day. But light, day, and night are not understood here to depend on the existence of the sun. So there's no reason to think that the word day means anything different on the first two days than what it means everywhere else in the Torah. People's reason for raising this is often to reconcile the biblical creation story with current evidence on the Earth's age, but it's better to recognize that the biblical story does not match the evidence than to stretch the story's plain meaning in order to make it fit better with our current state of knowledge. Superman from Florida, right? Like just take it on. There. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is, which is right. So that the Superman can fly is, is is a key thing, right? Which is like, which is be in the story, right? Don't watch Superman being like, people can't fly. I mean, you just got to roll with it and be like, people can fly, and like, if there's a piece of your destroyed planet in your presence, then that saps your strength. Like, just like go by the rules of the game. The rules of the game in this story is, it's a day. And if you believe the writers were sixth century BC, it, it, this is this is the way they could position it. Correct, and and if and if you go with with his take that their purpose isn't isn't or isn't just to explain how the world came into being, but to to explain how are we to act in the world that is created then it's a different proposition. It's not, the um, is this describing how the world came into being? It isn't the right question to that mind. It is, know that all the things that people worship, these are created. 
Right. And they could have flipped day three and four. Who cares? Right. Exactly. Right. Right. And that, that sense could have flipped day three and four, which is one way of approaching the Torah. Right. Why can't I eat pig? Why is it that? Why is it a cow that I can't eat? And the answer could be, eh. could be anything. This is just it. Just it, it just happens to be this. Why is this? Why is book the word for book and not C A T? Answer: It's not. There's no like grand meaning behind why B O O K means this and C A T means that. It's just you need a system, and this happens to be this system um so yeah that uh god and god made the two big lights the bigger light for the regulation of the day and the smaller light for the regulation of the night and the stars and God set them in the space of the skies to shed light on the earth. 18. And to regulate the day and the night and to distinguish between the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, there was morning, a fourth day. So, again, the uh, here... Um, Good, not a moral thing, just is. And the main purpose of this seems to be knocking down all of their neighbors' assumptions, right? People worship sun. People worship the sun. People worship the stars. This is saying, no. This, these are created things. You worship nature? No. That's the created thing. There's something behind it all. Don't mistake. And it could be, Cass says, read for a moral purpose. There's no morality in nature. There's no morality in the sun. It's all looking for something behind it. And that, by the way, could be when we get to the Noah story again, famously, you know, there's a Babylonian flood story. And I say this every year, you can read it in the essays in the back of the Eitz Chaim, that the, in the Babylonian flood story, the gods bring a flood because they're angry with humanity. Why they're angry with humanity? Because people are making too much noise. And the gods are disturbed by all the noise that they're making. And so because their humanity refused to turn down their proverbial stereo, they bring the flood, this will teach them. And the Noah story, why is God upset with humanity? Violence, morally bad, inhuman, right, right. So, so immoral behavior is what makes God angry. Note the difference, right? You know this from... Uh, life like how do we judge people who get really angry with like little petty things there's too much noise and how do we judge people who like get angry at moral outrages right so note that the hebrew god is concerned with morality the you know gods of nature as it were um here are concerned with um noise uh, with with petty things right like Right, their own comfort, right? Like that, good. Like the yeah. So like like that. So like that's that's probably the background here. So all of this, the sun, the moon, created, not essential. Um, verse twenty. Let, uh, and God said, let the water swarm with a swarm of living beings. Let the birds fly over the earth on the face uh, of the space of the skies. Great phrase. On the face of the space of the skies. Like the, uh, um, uh, the, here too, it really is teeming. It's like it's like a swarm. It's teeming. Like if you think of like a school of fish and things like that, that's what it is. Bugs will get the same word. Um, that bugs sort of swarm in that way. And looking forward, it's the word Pharaoh will use to describe the Israelites. When the Israelites are increasing, he's going to use that same word. Like you might see like a swarm of bugs and be like, ew. Like that's how Pharaoh sees the Israelites. Sees like a swarm of them. It's like, ew, like. Too many, too creepy. Um, so the same word is used in each spot. Um, uh, 21. And God created the big sea serpents and all the living beings that creep with, with, with which the water swarmed by their kinds and every winged bird by its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
The big reveal here is what does God create? How does how does he translate it? How does Alta translate it? See, did he translate monsters? Yeah. Sea monsters. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that crawls. Yes. So sea monsters, Tnaim. This is always, this appears a handful of times in the Tanakh, always means sea monster. What's a sea monster? Well, it probably means what you think it means. Whale. No, I don't think it's whales. Um, I think it means sea monster. <laughs> And mine is also sea giants. It doesn't say monster. Uh, he, uh, JPS or Art Scroll. Art Scroll. Art Scroll goes giants, right? Because Art Scroll wants giants because it wants it to be a whale. Um, it in all likelihood means something closer to a sea monster that you, you know, that, right, that you get out of the Loch Ness or, um, or out of a pirate story or something like that. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's an unnatural, we would say. Um, the star of a Japanese movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, yeah it, it's, it's a sea monster. And in fact, like, so this only picks up in a, in a couple of spots where it clearly references, it's referencing some legendary being. Um, the, uh, 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 his um, Friedman's comment is, this is generally understood to refer to some giant serpent-like creatures that were formed at creation, but later destroyed, associated with the monster as Rahab in Isaiah 51, or Leviathan, Isaiah 27. Later, Aaron, this is also an important point that he brings, Aaron's staff and the Egyptian magician's staff turn into the same word, Tanaim, not a snake, meaning, Nachash is the word for snake, when Aaron's staff turns into something, it doesn't turn into a Nahash. It turns into a Tnaim. It turns into a monster of some short sort. So, like, it's a, and again, like, which, which doubles down on the idea that it's some sort of magical thing going on because the word doesn't pop up all that often. Aaron's staff turns into this. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and it's here, and it's not something that you otherwise encounter. Um, That the la the that last sentence like could be the case. I don't think it's referencing the next story because the word the the serpent there is a different word. Um, so it's not parallel to the serpent in the garden. But the uh, um, but like that there are things that you wouldn't expect, and there's a and there's an unexpected diversity that does seem to be part of what's going on here. Um, what's unusual is that like they're it's singled out, right? There are lots of sea creatures and they're just called sea creatures. Everything that's in the sea, that's what's created here. Oh, and this other thing. So it's this special thing um, that exists that won't be referenced all that often. Um, and it seems to be, yeah, that there's some... Right. Right. And also, right. So as you right. So that it also, so it, God can create anything seems to be one part of it. Also, there definitely is a situation where others, naturally enough, will worship, you know, various sea creatures and things like this. And this is like, oh, you think they're monsters in the sea? Guess what? Those two, God created them. Don't worship that because there's something behind it all. 
Um, the so this could be and Leviathan sort of is that not quite a whale, something some giant sea creature and things like that that God either destroyed early on, like made it in order to destroy it to to, to demonstrate power. So their midrash team to that effect, um, and uh, the Leviathan, like one version of the sea creature, is supposed to be um, uh, involved in the last great battle in the time of the Mashiach, and when the Messiah finally comes. The great sea monster will be defeated, and you know this one. This is one of my favorite ones, and uh, the Leviathan will be defeated, and all of the tzaddikim will get to feast on yeah. Leviathan, and we will all do it in a sukkah made of Leviathan's flesh. So instead of like the wall being like whatever sort of tarp or canvas or whatever, it's going to be Leviathan skin sukkah. And if you read the blessings, um, the uh, uh, some of the blessings will actually reference that. Um, if you look like in an art school, there's a blessing for saying farewell to the sukkah, and it includes um, next year, may we dwell in the sukkah made of the Leviathan. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll see. Um, the I otherwise, as you might know, don't eat meat. But if we defeat the Leviathan and it is served to me and I qualify, I'm in. I would not say no. Um, right. So uh, the it tastes like chicken, right? Yeah. Verse uh, verse twenty two. Elohim lemor pruvu mlu ataretz beyamim beyamim. Um, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the water in the seas. Let the birds multiply in the earth. There was evening, there was morning, a fifth day. Um, so now here they are blessed. That I think this is our first instance of that, right? God blesses. And the blessing is specifically prove the word for pre fruit revu from rav be many multiply so be fruitful and multiply. This is uh, so the uh, uh, living things, animals and people will get this blessing. And note that it's seen again as a blessing. Um, it's it's a it's a positive thing that they're supposed to, that you're supposed to be doing. Um, so this. Um, that's that's unique to this situation and good again, not morally good, but fitting to their purpose. Um, so that's day five, um, day four, moving things in the heavens, uh, and then it sort of it gets slightly more complex. And then uh, this is fish and birds, um, twenty verse twenty four. Yeah. Sea monsters can be. Fruitful and multiply. Right. Right, right. Elsewhere, like the rabbis think that there's um uh that there's only I feel like they may think that there's only one that's a sort of keep, but no, it's like the different sea monsters, Naim. It is uh it is plural. The um so yes, they can. Um so what do you watch out? <laughs> Or build more sukkahs, right? Exactly. The um, the uh, um, uh, uh, Everett Fox notes: great sea serpents, the rebellious primeval monster of Psalm seventy four thirteen, common in ancient Near Eastern myth, is here depicted as merely another one of God's many creations. Um, the uh, so again, let's take a sort of like, yeah, they're out there, but subordinate to the greater power behind behind everything, right? Like the, uh, that. Be'omar Elohim, 24. Totsea aret nefesh chaya, the, uh, and God, uh, uh, v'nei 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 And God said, let the earth bring out living beings by their kind, domestic animal and creeping thing and wild animals of the earth by their kind. And it was so. Note here, um, what's, describe what's happening here. 
and verse 24. This is different from what happened at some other points in time, right? Because God, with some things, God said, and it was. Here, what's happening? Yeah, note, or not creating themselves, it's it's the earth. It's the same way that grass was created, right? Grass was like, was like let, let, let the earth bring forth grass. Here, it's let the earth bring forth animals, right? It's not, God isn't creating here out of nothing. Um, here, the creation out of nothing, as it, well, the earth seems to have maybe been pre-existing, right? Remember, like the, you just separate the waters and the land comes forth and the waters were was pre-existing the story. So, um, so the earth is what's producing humans. It's just saying, he, God's telling the earth, produce, or here, animals, produce animals, and it does, right? So it's not creation out of nothing. Um, the birth, would the earth bring out living beings by their kind, domestic animal and creeping thing, and wild animals of the earth by their kind, right? Like this is um, different types of, uh, the different words in Hebrew, right? Um, uh, um, so uh, 24 uh, altar is uh, cattle and crawling things and wild beasts of each kind. Cattle is sort of like a stand in for anything domestic, right? Notice how they, they're sort of like animals that you can, that you can domesticate and the ones that you can't separate creations. I know it was so 25. And God made the wild animals of the earth by their kind, the domestic animals by their kind, every creeping thing at the ground by their kind. And God saw that it was good, Kitov. Um, and then 26, this is the second half of sixth day. And God said, let us make a human in our image, according to our likeness. Let them dominate the fish of the sea and the birds of the skies and the domestic animals and all the earth and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. And God created the human in his image. He created the image, he created it in the image of God. He created them male and female. And God blessed them. Well, let's pause there. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things that are problematic about that. Right. Uh, Super problematic passage because suddenly out of nowhere you have the first person plural. It's doubled, right? It's, it, it, it's very clear. It's not just one word. It's two words in a row that are uh, that says um, um, let us create human in our image so so first of all just to emphasize the importance of the question whoa it's plural um the yeah right so here notice humans are created so again adam um Adam is again best translated as human, um, especially in chapter one. Chapter two, you can make an argument that man works, but like, uh, but uh, but the like the King James, let us make man in our own image, um, only works in like the classical sense of man when man means human. Now it's more common that man, you know, is like more is more specific, right? But human is better, and it's obvious that human is better because because it's male and female by the end of the sentence. So, um, so that so so there's lots going on here. And Adam, this is the key thing. Notice that because these animals are coming out of the ground, 
um, ground being, Adama, the, what comes out of the Adama is an Adam. Like this is why I've mentioned a few occasions that the, that the better translation is, is earthling even because he's made out of the earth. Um, but if you said earthling, it would sound like one of those, yeah, a fifties movie, like sort of like that. It, it, it would throw you off your game. But like the, but like, but earthling would work because the Hebrew has that sense that that this is some sort of growth out of the earth, which is, Cass will say, the other key moral point of the chapter. There, humans tend to worship nature as gods, which the Bible disagree with. And humans also tend to worship themselves as gods, which the Bible also disagree with. So this is that as well. You may be, it seems to be saying, the master of all the earth, as it were or the closest thing to a master of all the earth. And you may be tempted to worship yourselves as gods or to think of yourselves as gods. But guess what? You too, you too are created. You're even created on the same day as the animals, putting you in that category. So what's a day? At the very least, it's a category, right? So notice... Um, so like uh, sun, moon, and stars, that's a category. Earth and, and, and plants and trees, that's a category. Um, fish and birds, that's a category or two categories. Animals and people, that's a category. Guess like the, 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 the Torah is already on this. You're a type of animal, a distinct type of animal with distinct functions and responsibilities, but you're in this category. Um, and that I think is very deliberate. It could have put animals on day five, but it didn't. I mean, these are clearly mammals, right? Like it could have put mammals on day five, but it doesn't, and it doesn't on purpose. It's Rabbi, put humans and animals in that. Yeah. The uh, issue of the plurality uh, in uh, the Jewish uh, study Bible, it, it says the plural construction most likely reflects. Uh, the, a divine council, right? Uh, kings uh, and sites, uh, kings and Job. And uh, uh, the Psalm for Tuesday. The um, yeah. So that just for people that says like the um, the so not a sad down. There are many different ways of reading this. Um, but, uh, the one that that I think is actually likely most correct is God is thought of, though there's no reference to it here, but in general, God is thought of as a king, as it were. To get, um, the Tanakh will have the later, longest discussion later, but not right now. God is generally thought of in the Tanakh as masculine or male or something like this. Um, so God is depicted as a king in a court with the court with courtiers, with advisors, with an entourage surrounding him. So the uh so the uh so the Naasa Adam most likely is God saying to the courtiers in the court, um, let's do this. And why we switch scenes to that as opposed to just the let there be and there was is hard to understand, but here's another commentary. The courtiers were never created. They're, they're just sort of there. Now, wait, I, I want to give one, I want to give one um, little bit of, uh, there's one spot where it specifically pops up um, and that's the Psalm for Tuesday, which is Psalm 82, um, uh, which starts out, um, Elohim nitav be'edot el, b'chorov Elohim yishpot, um, which is, uh, God stands in the congregation of gods um, and uh, pronouncing judgment over the gods. How long will you pervert justice? How long will you favor the wicked champion, the wicked and the orphan, the uphold, the downtown and destitute? Da, da, da. Um, the Ania Marti Elohim Atem, I had said that you were God. 
Bnei Elyon Kulchem, that you are all children of the Most High. Echen Adam Timotun. Now, like humans, Adam, you will perish. Kachat Asarim Tifolu, like any like any ruler could fall. This seems to be a scene of God uh, presiding over the council of other lesser gods. This is the president at a cabinet meeting and saying, you're doing wrong. I asked you to uphold the right of the widow and the orphan, and you're just interested in power. So all of you, you're all demoted and you're all fired. <laughs> that seems to be what's going on in Psalm 82. That, Elon Musk. that probably gives some background to like what's going on here. God is saying, God's got a council and God is pronouncing. Sorry, Rich. There's another... Uh... Interesting commentary here in the Hertz. It says, it is not let man be created or let man be made, but let us make man. The use of the plural, let us make man, is the Hebrew idiomatic way of expressing deliberation. I don't know what the verb is for the, us. Deliberation, meaning that God hesitated before deciding to make man. Right. Yeah. So that's the that gives the there's a we're saying that the Hertz Kumas gives a kind of that, that that it implies a deliberate a deliberation and a hesitation. That's you know, there's these great midrashim that God's discussing with the angels, debating, you know, should we make humans or not? Don't make humans, they're just gonna mess up. It's like, well, we'll also do good things, and there's this back and forth argument. Um uh the so it could be that it um some say it's the royal we. Um, that's not that the us is just you know the you know Queen Elizabeth. We are we are not amused and things like that, which is comparatively unlikely because it's never used anywhere else. At least with the, like the Council of Gods, I've got a psalm that is weird, but like it's but it's there with the Council of Gods. Um, the the royal we you'd expect to see somewhere else if it is that. Art scroll. And God said to the ministering angel who had been created on the second day of the creation of the world, let us make man. When Moses wrote the Torah, he came to this verse, let us in bold, which is in the plural and implies that there is more than one creator. He said, Moses, sovereign of the universe, why do you thus furnish a pretext for heretics to maintain there is a plurality of the divinity? Quote, Right with an exclamation point, said God. Whoever wishes to err will err. Instead, let them from their creator, let them learn from their creator who created all. Yet when he came to create man, he took counsel with the ministering angel. Right. So it's all a test, is sort of what that is. Then that's a midrash that's polemic against a very specific polemic, right? So Christian writers said, Oh, when God says, let us make man in our image. Who is God the Father talking to? The Son, the Holy Ghost, like there's a Trinity. And that's like, who's God taking counsel with? There's proof right in your Bible. So that's what that little that little piece on like, oh, um, it's Moses. Uh, Moses says, why are you giving an opening to others to say that there's a plurality in heaven? It's very like, that's that would be a Midrash written after the rise of Christianity, um, giving a, uh, because... Uh, because this is um, is a perfect opening, right? Because you notice that the response to it isn't a great response. It's the response of it's his test. Just believe me, right? Isn't it, isn't as great a response as like, oh wait a minute, it is plural. Maybe, right? Like it's a tough one. So yeah. Day two. Yeah, yeah. That's well. Again, midrash. Right, because you need because you need to take everything that is because the text is terse. There's not a lot of a lot of things aren't described as being great. Yeah, so so they gem things into different days. Um, the midrashically, uh, there's also um, I have a great great children's book. You should look for it here um, that we read to the kids as that the that when God says us, God is speaking. Well, it's the same thing in any language. The the antecedent. What was the last thing referred to? The animals. So when God says, let us make man in our image, like let's make humanity in our image, God is saying to the animals, all right, next project. There will be, and the children's book is also based on the Midrash, where, but it's in children's book style, 
great where the uh, tiger says, uh, make him, you know, fast like us. And the uh, lion says, make him brave like me. And the uh, you know owl says make him wise like me and like da 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 da, da all through you can write the rest of the book yourself right like sort of like that so it's a um, so um, the animals like bring their qualities um, and God says and the essential godlike quality of freedom we are independent actors everything else is governed by instinct we are not governed by instinct in fact we're governed by lots of different things we can make a free choice right um the so the we're partly governed by instinct but not entirely right that's why the um so the uh so the godlike qualities are you can decide you're free you can be immoral you can be not good if you want right whereas again the um the fish can't be not good morally speaking the uh but you can i can the so that essential god likeness of having speech and having the ability to create meaningfully uh, i know beavers build dams um uh but those essential godlike things and the animal like parts of us we um you know we're born we die we have sex we eat and we and, and we defecate and all these things that are very animal-like some of the animal-like things we do behind closed doors or like on purpose right the defecation the sex like we're sort of ashamed of it and we keep it and we, and we keep it private but like so because that's animal-like and the god-like things you sort of like bring out in public like so that so that so th so it could also be this and i don't think it's a children's book but i think there could be something to that that maybe the us is to the animals and like we're taking godlike qualities and animal like qualities and that will be uniquely in this creature so, uh, so you're saying so so we're going to create you think the animals and see creatures and thoughts we're going to create humans you know in our end but then we're going to have dominion over them yes so, and they're gonna right, and what that dominion is is going to be will be will be tested or is or is currently being tested. Um, yes, because because people will end up using those extra level of skills um, dominate um, and uh, and uh, I mean that's like the next line. But that's supposed to be a blessing, right? God's going to bless them. Um, before we get there, just notice that the, uh, right, so, oh yeah, let them, oh wait, that actually, that's twice said that they're dominating. Dominate the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and domestic animals and all the earth and all the creepy things that creep on the earth. And God created the human in, in the divine image, created in the image of God. He created them male and female. Um, whether this is, it's not clear from the text whether this is one hermaphroditic creature or two, because it's not clear. Um, it's possible that there is a human being created, and the rabbis actually so pictured as as front and back male and female. That later on in the second Torah is just going to be like chiseled out. Um, Rib also, you know, the famous Adam's rib could can be side as well. This meaning side, in which case it's like this is a a, a male female creature that in chapter two gets separated into two beings. I mean, that's not man created first as it is, meaning male, um, but male and female are created first and just separated in chapter two. That's one. That's one way of reading it. Um, but at the very at the very least here, um, the zahar v'nekeva is like what we use for male and female, um, not man and woman. But it's like male, female. Like, so that to this day in Hebrew, uh, the nekeva, uh, by the way, is very earthy a term, just like Adam is earthy. Nekeva, it, like it's. Uh, it's like the root of the word for like uh, a cave or a hollow, meaning that it's a very, um, it's a very evocative term, um, sort of uh, 
uh, sort of bringing images of the sexual organ, right? Like that, like the, like the essential component, as it were. So this, like that's present already in the uh, already in the very word for uh, for female. Um, the uh, the being be exactly right. Yep. Um, the and fill the earth and subdue it, yeah. And uh, the um, two things before we get there because we have to wrap up. One, the image of God is it'll say, like, um, uh, he created in the image of God, he created the male and female. It knows that it's very specific male and female image of God, meaning what's meant by image here, it almost has to be something not physical. Um, it's not a physical thing. It's sort of, again, this ability to decide and to choose and to be a moral agent rather than a physical appearance because different physical looking things are being named. Um, the, uh, the, um, and uh, end with this, uh, Friedman's comment on be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. His comment is this commandment has now been fulfilled. <laughs> so. Uh, we'll pause there. We'll do. I was hoping to get through all of um, these uh, humans, but yeah, yeah. But this.